Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Watchmen Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli experts and practitioners in the fields of military, security, intelligence, and diplomacy. And our guest uh, today is our very own Danny Ayalon. It's sort of uh, cannibalism, <laughs> but uh, we'll keep you uh, safe and happy nevertheless. Thank you, Amir. I'm in good hands with you. Thank you and, and welcome. And um, the special angle which we will try to explore with you, Danny, is the Foreign Service and the Foreign Ministry of Israel because of your uh, own unique perspective or perhaps perspectives. Because as you will um, recount shortly, you started out as a junior officer then you were the policy advisor to the uh, prime minister or two prime ministers. And um, the prime minister, of course, um, has an overwhelming role in uh, foreign affairs in Israel. Then you served in Israel's uh, top diplomatic post as the ambassador to Washington. And finally, as a politician, um, as a deputy foreign minister. So um, if we take a holistic approach yeah, and um, you combine all of these vantage points, one can get uh, a true picture of the state of foreign affairs in Israel. Uh, why did you join the, um, the foreign ministry uh, in the first place? What was your background it's leading, very good leading up to it? I mean, for actually having most of my uh, adult years in uh, foreign affairs, uh, one would expect me to have some kind of a background in international relations or political science, none of the above. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I took economics. I got my master's in uh, business administration, and I even started at a uh, Israeli uh, large corporation. You may remember Kur Industries, which was a kind of a conglomerate. I was dealing with uh, overseas investments and things like that. It was but it uh, was an industrial company. It was an industrial company. Yes, but but earlier um, you grew up where I grew up. Yeah, I grew up uh, downtown Tel Aviv, not far from uh, where you uh, uh, grew up, and uh, you know normal uh, normal upbringing, uh, Boy Scouts, and then of course military. Uh, I uh, I was drafted just three months after Yom Kippur War. January 1974, so everybody was, you know, we had to fill the ranks, you know, that the brunt of the war was uh, absorbed by the Israeli uh, Armored Corps, so I went to the, uh, to the, I didn't have any choice to be an armored, and I liked it, uh, I became an, uh, an officer, a, a platoon, and then a company commander uh, during the reserve, I did many, many years uh, reserve duty, mostly in the Sinai and in the Gaza Strip. And, um, what sort of thing? Patton? Centurion? No, it was Centurion. Centurion during my uh, regular army, my, uh, my three and a half years. At that time, officers had to sign half a year. Now, it, they, now they sign a whole year. I did three and a half years in the Sinai with the Centurion. And uh, when the, <clears throat> I was released from the military, uh, the Centurion was on its way out. And they brought me and with my entire uh, company to go to a Russian T-55 uh, after the Yom Kippur War and also some remnants from 67, Israel had a whole division. Which it captured. Which it captured from um, Syria and from Egypt. Interesting. So we had three, uh, three uh, brigades. brigades. Of, well, one, one was a T-54, one was T-55, and then we had two battalions of T-62. At that time, T-62 was the, uh, the, the, the cutting edge at the time. And they were all called Tehran. Uh, Tehran, right. In right, right. They were called Tehran. And uh, so during my reserve, all my reserve was on this Tehran, on this T-55. And I can tell you, I realized why the Russians now lose and why the Arabs lost against us. Because, you know, um, if you compare the Russian tanks to the Western tanks, whether it's the Patton, you know, or the Centurion, which sure. are pretty much comparable, they were much larger, you know. So you could think, you know, that it's easy to acquire them as a, as a target. But at the other hand, they are so easy to maneuver 
and you have some space that you can be quite effective. This is the the the, the shot, the uh, the centurion and the pattern. Okay. They are bigger than the uh, than the Russian, so <clears throat> they are maybe uh, more easily detected because they are, they have a but silhouette. but they are more comfortable for the crew. Yes, you can you can right you can do much you faster. Have sp- you have space. You the have Russian space. tanks are for compact people. Very compact people, and there is no hardly uh, you know way to move. So in order to uh, you know put in a, uh, a shell, you know, in the cannon and all that, it takes you twice as much as it takes in the American. And then the moving and all that, it and was... Fi- fire control and all of that. Uh, yes, everything. And uh, of course, today, you know, if you... Uh, today, tanks are totally different with all computerized. But, but you had uh, no wish to stay in the military as a career officer? No. I had... Um, I, I was entertaining that, but, um, you know, when I was just about... To, uh, to finish my term, you know, my regular military. It was 1977, remember 77, September, Sadat is arriving. I said, wow, we have now peace. They will not need my service anymore. So I went to the uh, Tel Aviv University and I took economics. Okay, and then, and then you weren't uh, to work for Kur. How come uh, you ended up um, yeah. in the uh, uh, New York mission? Yeah, so I spent uh, about uh, five years with core and I did finance and at the end of the day I didn't like it it was all numbers you know and the crunching numbers it was boring I got bored and I was looking for something else to do and then in the paper I saw that the foreign office had uh, you know had a, um, a call a tender for uh, cadets to the foreign office with a very interesting career and all that I thought wow that's something that I may uh, be uh, interested in. See, I got my MBA in the United States. So I had some American background. Uh, my English was okay. So I thought that I have some, uh, you know, some advantages over there. So this is how I started with the foreign uh, office. My first position was in Panama. So I also learned Spanish, which I am very proud of, my Spanish. You speak Panamanian. I speak uh, Panamanian Spanish, that's right. And from Panama, they moved me to the United Nations, to our mission to the UN. And at our mission to the UN, I also had the, um, the, the privilege and pleasure to work with a very good ambassador, which was also a senior politician, Gadi Akobi. And uh, with him, you know, I was his chief of staff. So I could really see the entire gamut of our activities over there. But you were designated a trade diplomat or uh, was it uh, from the beginning uh, the policy side of the house? From the first, uh, the policy side, yeah, the policy side. Also, you know, at at that time... Commercial trade. Yes, yes. At that time, they had, um, still they have the policy of, uh, um, you know, being a, um, a, almost a jack of all trades. Some say master of none, but, uh, um, you know... As a junior officer. As a junior officer, I went through the political uh, channel. There was also an administrative channel for uh, administration officers sure. which was uh, which was uh, separate separate okay so so um, uh, almost immediately following panama which was perhaps not a hardship post but uh, not one of the major ones uh, for the israeli foreign ministry you went to one of the most coveted postings in New York City. In New York, yes. And, um, well, there also, you know, sometimes things happen by chance. You know, you don't, uh, you never know. Um, we had a visit at that time when I was in Panama. By the way, in Panama, I was 92 when the uh, Israeli uh, embassy in Buenos Aires was bombed. So we had some time of very heightened security uh, alerts and all that. But... We had at that time a deputy foreign minister, a very able guy by the name of Yossi Bailey, who came to Panama on his way, uh, I think, down south to to Argentina. And we had a nice talk. And uh, I guess he remembered that. And when the time came to uh, position a diplomat in New York, he thought of me. And that's how I ended up in uh, New York. But he didn't tell you... Listen, in 20 years' time, you, Danny, may also end up as deputy foreign minister. No, and I, I, never, I never really thought of that. I, uh, all I wanted to do is just to do my job and enjoy my, my path. But what changed it, really, was that after New York, four years in the mission to the, to the UN, 
I was seconded on the way back to Jerusalem, I was seconded to the prime minister's office. Before you get to the prime minister's office, New York hosts not only the Israeli UN mission, but also the consulate general, uh, which is the biggest um, in the United States. Uh, also the uh, defense purchase, purchasing mission, but this is uh, probably secondary and uh, handles mostly technical details, even though at uh, one time, especially under Yossi Chekhanova, later the director general of the foreign ministry, it had a policy role. But these two missions uh, housed in the same building, the consulate general and the UN mission, are they competing or cooperating? Well, and I, also the Washington embassy. <laughs> I would say uh, comparating, you know, competing and uh, cooperating at the same time. Yeah, I think it's uh, they, they put them together in the same building for uh, savings because they joined the same administration. It's 800 Second Avenue. It's on Second Avenue and 42nd. This is the famous uh, uh, building. Same security. And the same security. So, right. So you have the same infrastructure so that it makes but when you sense. But when you take the elevator, you decide whether to get off at the 14th or the 15th or the 16th. That's the... Uh, that's right. No, it was. I think it was too close for comfort. I mean, when you have uh, and uh, uh, I mean, we have some anecdotes. The you know, the, actually, it all starts from the top. If the relationship between the ambassador to the UN and the consul general, or even the head of the you know the security uh, the, the defense mission, if they are all in good terms, everything flows from that. If they are not in good terms. God forbid, they don't talk to each other, they hide things from each other, and it's not always to the best interest of the, of the country. Especially when um, dignitaries visit the <laughs> prime minister, the foreign minister, many ministers descend on you and you have to escort them. And uh, of course, the major Jewish American organizations and the major media outlets are in town so yes. you have a full plate. You have a full plate. Um, uh, very, very busy. There is in, that's that's what uh, the, the funny thing is. There is enough work and enough honor and respect for everybody. But yet, if the ambassador to the United Nations is invited to speak somewhere, the consul general either will, uh, you know, will not go. Uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find some other commitment. Yes, and we'll call on the uh, organizers and yell at them. Why did they order him and vice versa? What happens during the uh, General Assembly when uh, whole motorcades of visiting presidents, prime ministers and the like descend on Manhattan? Um, do you also remember some secret meetings between Ambassador Jacobi and his counterparts or foreign ministers from countries at the time not having formal relations with Israel? Absolutely. And I think the, the UN is, I would say, the most natural place to have these secret meetings. And uh, since I was his chief of staff, you know, also I went with him. We met before we had any formal relations. We had meetings with the Qatari. We had meetings with the Moroccan. We had meetings with Afghanistan at that time and with Pakistan, with the Pakistani ambassador uh, as well. Um, and I can tell you with Qatar, it was very funny. Uh, the Qatari actually came to, uh, to us, to, to Ambassador Jacobi, and talked about, before we had formal relationship, about maybe getting some technology from Israel. Why? And he explained to us. He says, you know, we have natural gas, but our natural gas are good only for 25 years. So we would like to have some hedging and replace it. Okay. We started talking. We brought some missions and all that. After about six months, the track got cold. They don't return our calls. They don't do anything. And then we find out that another huge field of natural gas was discovered by Qatar for another 250,000 years. So Israel could So wait. call us back in 50 years. Exactly. Now, but uh, uh, with uh, Pakistan, Pakistan, of course, is a nuclear uh, weapon uh, state. Uh, Israelis are always worried that if uh, the uh, regime there disintegrates, um, the so-called Islamic bomb might get into the wrong hands. Did that topic come up? Yes, and especially um, a relationship with the ISA. The ISA is the uh, intelligence service. The CIA of, of Pakistan. Uh, right. 
And always the concern was whether the, um, the ISA uh, has been penetrated, you know, by extremists, whether it would be uh, Iranians of, or... Of course it was, and, uh, and it, was. it uh, protected Osama bin Laden. Exactly, exactly. But uh, mostly we tried with them to have some kind of commercial uh, relationship. I mean, uh, strategy-wise, at that time, we didn't have very good relationship with India. Today, of course, I think no ambassador would uh, dream of meeting his uh, Pakistan. We, we talked about competition with the Consul General, but uh, when you have such a secret contact, is that competition with Mossad? Well, yes. Yes. You know, uh, actually, the, the, the Mossad major, um, let's say, uh, station is in Washington. It's not in uh, New York. Uh, it's the liaison office with the American intelligence e community. Exactly. And you know that um, it used to be, until Pollard, I knew that there was a lot of uh, competition. But after Pollard, you know, there is a directive by prime ministers not to collect uh, intelligence in the United States. The Pollard affair is in late 1985, but it never ended. It never ended. Anyway, so uh, so right now, uh, as far as, com you know, on, on collection, there is no competition whatsoever because they uh, they do not collect. And, you know, the... Uh, the but diplomacy, liaison... And diplomacy, of course, this is all, at the end of the day, it's all collection, right? But it's legitimate uh, collection. But uh, we don't do anything under the table. Mossad was not doing anything under the table. If anything, Mossad at some point wanted to have a piece in policy making. And this was uh, kind of a little bit, sometimes there was a little... Especially uh, when you have foreign ministers with ego. Exactly. Which, exactly. Is, which is almost always the case. Maybe deputy ministers do not have <laughs> an ego. Now, you came back, you were seconded to the uh, prime minister's office. So here you are, a foreign service officer. Your promotion later will depend on the um, uh, goodwill of the foreign ministry, not only the political echelon, but also the director general Absolutely. and others who uh, have a long memory of how, how um, you are well. handling them from very, the other side of very. town. And so you're actually you're schizophrenic because first of all, you know, your promotion you know, everything is dependent on the foreign ministry. But professionally, you work with the prime minister and his team. And as you mentioned, there is rivalry sometimes between the foreign minister and the prime minister, even if they are from the same party. Even if it's the same guy. Even, <laughs> sometimes even if it's the same guy, absolutely. And uh, as you know, uh, if we have time to talk about it, the, the foreign minister was always kind of the uh, black sheep in the family of whether the intelligence community or the foreign affairs. I think it goes all the way from Ben-Gurion time, Ben-Gurion and Sharet. Moshe Sharet was our first foreign minister. Ben-Gurion didn't like him very much. So uh, he uh, kind of um, isolated and compartmentalized the, the, the foreign, and it continued as a, in any case, when you work with the prime minister, he does things that he does not want the foreign ministry to know either because he's afraid of leaks or, or any other things. So what do you do? I decided that I, uh, you, know, where you, uh, you know, where you sit is where you stand. So I stood with the prime minister's office. And I didn't uh, get much support and appreciation from the foreign ministry. And you knew that you were going to be punished. And I knew I was going to be punished, but I, I um, you know, it's also my, I guess, my character. I, I couldn't just... Before me, you know, they had some officers, right, who were seconded, who were working on both, you know, they were like a doubled or triple mm -hmm. agents, you know. They would, you know... Both uh, sides of the streets. Yes, yeah. and, and I decided not to. Now, the foreign ministry uh, has an uh, input uh, both on your rank as an officer, uh, because you move up from... Secretary, second secretary, to, to counsel, secretary, yeah. counselor, minister, minister eventually yeah. career ambassador. Right. This is, of course, distinct from the posting. You can be an ambassador somewhere, but not have the rank of ambassador. Right. Right. And they, of course, uh, decide on your posting too, unless this is part of the dozen or so so-called political appointment. So you worked with, who were the prime ministers you worked for? So I started back in 97 with Bibi Netanyahu on his first term. And at that time we did the Y 
plantation, and oh, I remember. Um, you you were number two to Uzi Arad. I was number two to Uzi Arad, and um, again, the foreign minister always wanted me to get him a lot of kind of uh, secret information. Either David Levy or Ariel Sharon. Absolutely. Both, both very prominent politicians. <laughs> right. And, uh, and, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I told him, listen, I, uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know. It, it was enough uh, for you to leak to the press. Do you have to leak to the foreign <laughs> minister too? I said, I'm not. I am, I'm signed on, uh, you know, on secrecy. I cannot uh, do that. In any case, uh, so we did the white plantation. We did this and that. 1999, Bibi lost the elections. Barack started uh, the prime. The came aboard. Came, and he asked me to stay. You know, because he brought people from the military, generals, Dania Tom, Staubers, who had nothing to do with diplomacy. You know, the very, very etiquette of diplomacy. So they needed me to arrange the chairs. Chief of protocol. Yes. So I stayed with them. And lo and behold, after a year and a half, Barack lost the the elections to uh, Sharon. Sharon. And Sharon liked me for some reason. And he promoted me to be the, uh, the chief foreign policy advisor. And after a year and a half... Uh, so, so while prime ministers um, lost their, their jobs, you were the only I, permanent fixture there. I was a permanent fixture there, yes. For five years, I worked I, five years and three prime ministers. And then for, uh, Foreign Minister Paris and Prime Minister Sharon uh, argued over who is going to take over the most coveted post right. in Israeli diplomacy, Washington, the Washington Embassy. How did you end up there? Well, at, at the envy of your yes. colleagues. Well, there was a whole list ahead of me, but they didn't agree on them. You know, if Paris thought of somebody, Sharon said no, he couldn't trust him, and vice versa. The only one, it, apparently, that they could trust was me, because I was not uh, political. I was a professional. And here, I must say, um, it again shows the naivete of uh, Shimon Paris. Eric Sharon was very wily. Eric Sharon was, you know, he knew how to... Shimon Peres was, was, was yeah. uh, no shriek violet uh, either. So uh, anyway, after they went through the, the list, Shimon Peres came with the idea. You know what? Let's bring somebody from the ministry. And he thought of somebody from the ministry that would report to him, would be answerable to him. And he had a name, Yoram Benzev. Later the ambassador to Germany, Berlin. To, yes. And Arik Sharon, you know, with him, he said, well, he knew he was going to bring me somebody from the ministry. He will report to him. I have an idea. Dani Ayalon is also from the ministry, although he works for me here. So, but he, let's say, he fills in the check of being from the ministry. So he said, why don't we do Dani Ayalon? Now, this is the Bush administration. That's the Bush administration. The, first, the second Bush administration, uh, George uh, W. Uh, Bush. Um, and there is also, we talked about competition between various Israeli officers. There is also competition between Israel's Washington embassy, the prime minister's office, and in a way, the U.S. embassy in Tel Aviv. What is the, the major juncture through which uh, information and exchanges flow? What was the time uh, okay. under well, Sharon? Well, at the time, I, I'll tell you, I benefited from the fact, you know, that before I uh, was appointed to Washington, I was foreign policy advisor. So as po- foreign policy advisor, I made a point to start very, very close relationship with Condoleezza Rice, who was the national security advisor. By the way, this also worked for me when Sharon decided to send me to, to Washington. And uh, I remember that uh, Condoleezza called him to thank him and saying, well, now at least I will not have to make a long distance call to reach Daniel alone. It will be just in town. Anyway, so uh, when I went there, they had an uh, American ambassador here, Dan Kurtzer, who, again, Sharon disliked. Why? Dan Kurtzer is Jewish. He came from Cairo. Uh, He's uh, a well-known expert on Israeli affairs. Uh, perhaps a bit left of Sharon in political terms. Much left of Sharon, especially at the time, before the disengagement. And Sharon um, had his ways of understanding, I'm saying it very politely and very mild, to uh, to uh, understand that Kurtzer is not a fan of Sharon and does not speak well about Sharon in Washington, D.C. 
And so we had Dov Weissglass, uh, so, yes, his um, associate. Um, right. At that time, it was still somebody else. Uri Shani was there. In any case, um, Dan Kurtzer was pretty much put out of the loop because the Americans, they have a very, very uh, keen sense. Danny, in, in the one minute we still have, what is the secret of success for Israeli ambassadors in Washington? I guess, well, first of all, they have to understand to put an ego aside. And uh, sometimes, first of all, you have to be in the know. You have to work, you have to always watch your back to have your good sources in the prime minister's office because, you know, the prime minister doesn't talk to you every day, you know, maybe once a week. So first and of all- And it's a seven hour difference. And seven, right. So first of all, secure somebody, have an ally. Dov Weisslas, he was my ally, so we worked together to the, to the, to the fact, to the, you know, to the extent that Arik Sharon, every, every time after Weisslas was visiting Washington, D.C., Arik Sharon called me to see if Weisslas reported him correctly. Anyway, but basically to be an ambassador is also to, uh, to build a coalition a coalition of support for Israel. So you have the Jewish, uh, you know, the Jewish community, you have business community, Congress community in Congress. Now, as deputy the foreign press. minister, when you looked at the foreign ministry, did your view change? 20 seconds. Yes, I, I uh, actually, I appreciated more the professionalism of the, uh, the foreign minister because I never had a chance to work in Washington, in the bu bureaucracy of the ministry. So here, when I saw the entire cross-section of the bureaucracy, I appreciated much more. These are people who are underpaid, overworked, and they're very, very smart. But sometimes they are uh, frustrated because they're not appreciated enough. Ambassador Danny Ayalon, uh, former member of Knesset and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, thank you very much Pleasure. for an interesting conversation. This has been Watchmen Talk. And uh, we will be soon with another edition. Shalom from Jerusalem.